So I want to begin by saying something that at first glance may seem provocative, and I think it probably is to some of you, but it shouldn't be. What I want to start off by saying is that Christianity is anti-religious. And when I say that in a lot of places, people are like, well, what are you talking about? I mean, Christianity is a religion. What do you mean that Christianity is anti-religious? Well, this is what I mean. Religion is the idea that we must do certain things and become a certain way for God to love us. Religion says that we must get right and get clean if we want to get on God's good side. Religion is all about doing good and sinning less. It's all about earning and deserving and getting gold stars for good behavior. Religion and its main message is basically our need to do more and try harder for God. That's really the message of religion. It's what makes up the content, sadly, of a lot of sermons and books and social media posts. Religion may give lip service to Jesus hanging on a cross for us, but its emphasis is you and me climbing a ladder for Jesus, doing more, trying harder, getting better. So as strange as this may sound, religion is actually not about God at all. It's about me. It's about my performance. It's about my obedience. It's about my faithfulness, my improvement, my sacrifice, and all of those things, my discipline. In fact, I would go so far as to say religion breeds narcissism because it's always pushing us back into ourselves. It's constantly encouraging us and imploring us to look at ourselves, to think about ourselves. Am I sinning less? Am I doing all the things I should be doing? Am I getting better? And so on and so forth. Religion breeds a spiritualized navel gazing that is very soul shrinking in nature and very enslaving, actually. The focus of religion is on how I can make things right between God and me by what I do and by how good I can become. That is why I say Christianity is anti-religious. Now, I'm very well aware of the fact that the Bible itself in a couple of places uses the word religion positively. And within certain contexts and in front of certain people, I too would use the word positively. But even in those contexts in the Bible where the word religion is used positively, it's not speaking about religion as you and I know it today, as it is constantly delivered to the masses today. See, the message of Christianity is, is not a message about you and what you need to do for God. The message of Christianity is about God and what he's done for you. In other words, Christianity is all about grace. And grace defies religious logic. It rebels against religious logic. Grace has nothing to do with earning and merit and deservedness. In fact, grace is opposed to what is owed. It's very counterintuitive. Grace is the opposite of fairness. Grace is being loved when you are unlovable. Grace is a liberating contradiction between what we deserve and what we get. What we deserve from God and what we get from God. That's what grace is. Religion is fundamentally about keeping a moral code. Christianity, on the other hand, is fundamentally about a gracious God who saves people that fail to keep the moral code. It's a huge difference. The simplest way for me to put it is like this. Religion is about our goodness being rewarded. Christianity is about our badness being forgiven. Okay, there's a, those are two very different things. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Galatians says, this gospel, this do more, try harder, get better, clean yourself up kind of gospel that you guys, that you Galatians have been buying into is really no gospel at all. In fact, that's not good news. That's bad news. 
Good news is relieving. Good news relieves you of the pressure to do more and try harder and get better for God. So if it doesn't sound too good to be true, it's probably not the gospel. Well, believe it or not, and I find that a lot of people, especially inside churches, are surprised when I say this, but believe it or not, the goal of Christianity is not to make you a better person. It's not the goal. I think a lot of people think that's the goal, that the goal of Christianity is that it's a vehicle to make us sin less. Okay, that it's, that it's, it's there because it's intending to make us better people. But the goal of Christianity is so much bigger than that, okay? The goal of Christianity is to give you Christ. The goal of Christianity is to deliver his righteousness and his love and his forgiveness to sinners like you and me, free of charge. That's the goal. The gospel is not a a means to an end. It's the end itself. It's the announcement that all has been paid Our debts have been canceled, and that we live our lives under a banner that reads, it is finished. Full stop. Not, it is finished, now what? It is finished. Now just rest, relax, and enjoy the gift. Just enjoy the gift. I mean, the the Christian life, okay, I can describe the Christian life in two ways. Well, I can describe it in a lot of ways, but two ways this morning. Number one, the Christian life is simply adjusting to our freedom. That's it. That's one way to put it. Another way to put it is Christianity is all about just enjoy the gift. You know, if you're a parent on Christmas morning, you give your, you give gifts to your children. What really brings your heart satisfaction and joy is just watching them enjoy it. You don't give it to them and say, okay, I hope you like that. Now where's mine? I mean, any parent who does that is looked at like a jerk. Okay. But we assume that's the way God is for some reason that, you know, okay, God's given us this gift. Now we have to spend our lives paying him back for what he's done, as if we could do that anyway. You see, the reason Christianity is not fundamentally about us being good or getting better or sinning less is because none of those things actually solve our deepest problem. I mean, none of those things really solve our deepest problem. Being good or getting better or sinning less doesn't solve my deepest problem. We say things, for instance, like, nobody's perfect, as if that's okay. We've so normalized imperfection that we don't see imperfection as the eternal catastrophe that it is. God demands perfection, not goodness, not trying hard. He demands perfection. Perfection. What does Jesus tell the religious people in the Sermon on the Mount? After he says a bunch of stuff that really levels the playing field and helps them see that they're no better than the worst guy they know, he sums up that whole section of the Sermon on the Mount by saying, basically, you need to be perfect as your Father in Heaven is perfect. And then he just drops the mic. Like, put that in your pipe and smoke it. You think you're better than that person, or you think you're better than that person? Anything short of perfection is damnable, Jesus says. So imperfection's a serious thing. This is no joke. God demands perfection, not goodness, not trying hard, not simply getting better. He, he demands sinlessness, not simply sinning less. So in light of God's command to be perfect, becoming a better person doesn't help me. Getting better doesn't help me. We need someone to do for us and to give to us what we cannot do and get for ourselves no matter how hard we try. That's what we need. And this story is one of my favorites in all the Bible to illustrate that Christianity is not about good people doing good things. Rather, Christianity is about a good God doing great things for bad people. That's what this story speaks so loudly and clearly about. When I say things like this, and I've said this stuff for years now, when I say things like God loves and uses bad people because bad people are all that there are, I always get pushback. I always get somebody going, hold on a second, what do you mean by that? You know, what do you mean bad? 
I'm not bad. I mean, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not bad. I mean, what, what do you mean that God loves and uses bad people because bad people are all that there are? What do you, I always get pushback. When I say things like, you'll never know how good God is until you first realize how bad you are, someone always objects. It's like we have this fixation of needing to think that we're good people. We're obsessed with this for whatever reason. We, f- we, we, we feel like our self-esteem depends Our worth, our value, our significance, our stability and security depend on me thinking I'm a good person, believing I'm a good person. There are a handful of reasons why I get pushed back and why people object when I say stuff like that. But one of them is because we typically understand the word good in terms of what we do and what we don't do. That's how we define good. In this sense, if that's the definition we're using, that a good person is one who does good things and a bad person is one who does bad things, in this sense, I would call myself good much of the time. I mean, I I care about other people. I love my wife. I'm always there for my kids. I, I help people when and where I can. I don't break the law except when I drive, and then I break it gloriously. Um, I think I'm pretty nice and friendly for the most part, and those who know me best would probably agree with all that stuff. But how do I reconcile this definition of good, the one that I just used, that a good person is one who does good things and a bad person is one who does bad things, how do I reconcile this definition of good with Jesus' words here that no one is good but God? And that doesn't seem right to me because I I know a lot of good people. I mean, my wife, for instance, Stacy, is one of the best people I know. I mean, she's selfless and kind and giving and generous and I mean, I know a lot of good people, so I don't understand what Jesus means here. What do you mean that there is no one good but God? Clearly, that's an overstatement. That's an exaggeration for effect, right? Well, what do you mean there's no one, no one good but God? How can we say that? I mean, I, I know lots of good people. Well, the answer lies in what we usually mean when we use the word good and the way in which God uses the word good. There's a difference between the way we use the word good and the way God uses the word good. As I said a minute ago, the way we normally define goodness has to do with what a person does or does not do. It's predominantly behavior-oriented. A good person is one who does the right things and avoids the wrong things, and a bad person is one who does the wrong things and avoids the right things. A good person is someone who is nice and kind, and a bad person is someone who is selfish and mean. That's typically how we understand it. But in this passage, Jesus reveals the way God defines goodness, which is very different than that. His question, and this is the first thing to notice from the uh, rich young ruler here, his question when he comes up to Jesus is religious to the core. His question is essentially religious. What does he say? Good teacher, what must I do? Now, just for one second, okay, just consider the arrogance and the pomposity of a question like that. Good teacher. You know, this guy had the world at his fingertips. He had lots of money. He probably, as a result of having a lot of money, had a lot of power, a lot of influence, So he kind of walks up to Jesus, and it says he fell at his feet. So there was a humble posture there, at least bodily speaking. But he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That is a religious question to the core. It assumes that I have the power, the wherewithal, the spiritual integrity to do the right things to dot all of the right I's and cross all of the right T's to such a degree that it will impress God and he will therefore accept me based on what I do, my merit, what I've earned. It's religious to the core because it's anti-grace in the very form of the question. What must I do? Now, Jesus could have said, buddy, there's nothing you can do, okay? In fact, It was humanity's doing that created this mess in the first place. 
I've actually come to undo everything you've done. That's my mission here. He could have said that, but he didn't. He goes through some of the Ten Commandments. Well, if you want to know what to do to inherit eternal life, well, you know what the commandments say. Just do this and do that and do this, that, and the other. And this guy's response is laughable. I mean, it's just, it's laughable. It's laughable. He's like, well, okay, <laughs> I've been doing that stuff since I was a kid. That's child's play. What, are you kidding me, Jesus? Give me something. Give me a challenge. Come on. Give me something I haven't accomplished. Give me something I haven't done. I mean, what do you mean? Oh, that, that's the Ten Commandments? Come on. That's first grade. Give me something bigger. Give me a bigger mountain to climb. Um, now, if I were Jesus, and I'm not, just for the record, but if I were Jesus, I would have said, dude, are you kidding me? I mean, how freaking delusional are you? You think you've kept this stuff from the time you were a kid? From the time you came into this world, you've been a rule keeper, a God honorer. You've kept all of God's commandments. What are you joking? I mean, Jesus could have said, you want to know what you have to do? As long as you're asking what you need to do, I'll tell you. Be perfect. And what that means, rich young ruler, is you must love perfectly. You must love sacrificially and selfish, selflessly, not just on the outside, but on the inside too. In other words, you must want to love perfectly and sacrificially and selflessly all the time. It's not just a matter of what you do on the outside. You got to want to do it on the inside. Your motives have to be pure, all the time, sinless. He could have said, you know what be perfect means, rich young ruler? It means never, ever hurt anyone. Never hurt them physically, never hurt them relationally, never hurt them emotionally. In fact, and this goes even deeper, you can never even want to hurt anyone. In fact, you must want to help everyone all the time. He could have said, hey, rich young ruler, you want to know what it means to be perfect? It means this. If there is, if anyone has a need, anyone, you have to meet it, especially your enemies. You can never hold grudges. You can never anger your children. You can never, ever lust. You can never, ever be proud. Don't ever talk about someone behind their back. Never seek revenge. Don't retaliate. In fact, you can never even want to retaliate. Ever. He could have gone on and said, you want to know what it means to be perfect? I'll tell you. If there is any desire in your heart at all to hold a grudge, to not forgive, to be proud, to lust, to gossip, to be greedy, even if you don't act on those desires, the desire to do it is itself sinful. So you can't even desire any of those things ever. Now, he could have said all that to this guy. And I would have to just level him, you know, drop the hammer on him to humble him and help him see what can I do to it. You idiot. You can't do anything. Just shut up and rejoice in what's been done for you. Okay. That's what I would have said. Cause I'm kind of jerky and impatient in that way. But Jesus didn't. In fact, it, I love how the passage even describes Jesus's disposition. After this guy utters this nonsense about how he's been keeping all the rules since he was a kid, Jesus says, it, the Bible says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. He wasn't annoyed. He wasn't like, dude, you're, you're an idiot, man. I mean, he, he, just, he looked at him with compassion. And then he says, okay. He, he didn't correct that. I mean, I would have corrected it. We, we long for people to do stuff that we have an opportunity to correct, okay? I mean, Jesus could have corrected him perfectly, and instead, he says, okay, he doesn't correct that. He just says, okay, there's one thing you need to do. If you've done all that, good job. There's one thing you need to do. Go sell everything you got and give it away to the poor and then come follow me. And it says he walked away sad because he had a lot of money. Now, I always found it interesting why Jesus would tell him to do that because that's not one of the Ten Commandments. You know, you look at the Ten Commandments, there's nothing in there about going and selling everything you have and giving it to the poor. So why is Jesus saying that? I'll tell you why he's saying that. 
Because if you know what the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. He's trying to show this guy, dude, (laughs) you can't even get out of commandment number one unscathed. You think you've kept all these others? I mean, my gosh, man, you can't even, money is your God. Possessions are your God. Control and influence and power, that's your God. You're not willing to give that up. You're, 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 you think you've kept all the commandments. You, you haven't even kept commandment number one. And so the guy walks away sad. Jesus wants to make one very clear point. To be in with God requires total perfection, sinless devotion, untainted faultlessness, unbounded sacrifice, and absolute generosity. Now, I've listened to preachers who say that, and then they stop. And they go, therefore, go do that. Okay? I mean, there are a lot of preachers out there who will say things like, in order to be in with God, your faith has to be faultless. You have to be strong, devoted, committed. In fact, if you're not committed to God in every moment, more than you're committed to anything else, you may not even be a Christian. You need to question whether or not you even know God. That's a lot of preaching these days. Okay, Trust me, I'm in a lot of different places. That's why I say this is a very unique and special place. Because that's not what you get here. And that is, that is not Christianity. It's religion and it's, it's bondage inducing. It doesn't give God glory. That's for sure. Um, and so Jesus wants to make this point to be in with God. You got to be, you got to be perfect, man. You got to, your devotion has to be sinless. You're, you have untainted faultlessness, faithful to the core, generous to the core. So when Jesus says, no one is good but God, and here's the good news, because that's what God demands, perfection. Not my progress. Good job, man. You're, you know what? I'll let you slide on the imperfection stuff because I see you're really trying hard. You know, God doesn't grade on a curve that way. And if he did, Jesus ruined it, okay? <laughs> because he was perfect. So you don't have a chance, either do I. If you are basing your acceptance with God or God's love for you on anything you do or anything you can contribute, you're in trouble. We're all in trouble. So when Jesus says no one is good but God, he's not saying the whole human race is filled with mean people who never do anything good and right. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that in God's economy and according to God's standard of perfection, there is only one who is good. Only one. And had the rich young ruler stuck around, he would have heard the only news that could have set him free. Verse 27, with man it is impossible, but not with God. Remember in John chapter 6, I think it was John chapter 6, I could be wrong though. Um, Jesus with his disciples, they're super serious about following Jesus and they, they want to be God honoring men and they want to take God super seriously and so they ask him, Jesus, what must we do? Very similar question to this one. What must we do uh, to be doing the works of God? Now, we're serious about this God stuff, Jesus, and and we want to be serious Christians. We want to be found faithful so that when my life is over and all of my good deeds are lined up before the throne of grace, God will say, based on that and that alone, well done, good and faithful servant. How many times have you heard that? Like, now live your life in such a way where when you finally get to heaven, you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. The arrogance of that kind of statement. As if God's pronouncement of well done is based on what I do or what I've done. We, are, we hear those words because we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We hear those words because his good stuff has been put on us. Not that we bring our goodness to the table. And so had he stuck around, he would have heard the only news that could have set him free. He could have heard, gosh, you know, with with man it's impossible, but not with God. 
God makes all things possible. It is, in other words, impossible for us to do enough, say enough, sacrifice enough, pray enough, confess our sins enough, be good enough, improve enough, or be clean enough to get God's love and acceptance. It's impossible to be enough, to do enough. Christianity is the announcement of the one who is good achieving the impossible for us. Being enough for us. Christianity is not first and foremost about your transformation. It's first and foremost about Christ's substitution. What he did for us. Christianity announces the one who is good meeting our failures with his forgiveness, our weakness with his strength, our messiness with his mercy, our guilt with his grace, and our exhaustion with his rest. Christianity announces the one who is good paying our tab in full and clothing us in a straitjacket of divine pardon. Christianity announces the one who is good, setting us free from the need to prove ourselves worthy and lovable and good, from the need to clean ourselves up to come to God. So, before God, the goodness of God is all we have. And before God, the goodness of God is all we need. So let me just close with uh, this illustration that I heard many years ago, and I forgot, I forget who, who said it, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and take credit for it because it's so good. Um, <clears throat> so this person was describing the gospel and saying, you know, it's one thing to say that our, our debt has been paid. What amazing good news is that? We've, we've really, we, 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 are, um, we are people in massive debt, and our, the good news of the gospel is our debt has been paid. He said, but that's, that's only part of it. And this person went on to just illustrate that point by saying this. Suppose you were $20 million in debt. And there was absolutely no way you were going to be able to pay that money back. No way. I mean, there's no way you can pay that back. In fact, it keeps you up at night because you know that you'll never be able to pay it back. But, and this debt is now going to be transferred on to your kids and even your kids' kids long after you die. You feel like you have failed your family. You feel like you haven't provided. You feel like you've screwed up. And now you have burdened your family for generations to come. And you walk in the bank one day to meet with the president because you want to sort of work on, you want to get a lower interest on your loan. <clears throat> and the bank president meets you in the lobby and says, Talian, you're not going to believe this. And I'm, I'm telling you the truth here. Some guy who wants to remain anonymous walked in here earlier this morning and paid your debt in full. Beck, wait, come again? Say what? Your debt's been paid. That $20 million you owed that you knew you could never pay back, it's been erased. It's, been, it's, it's, it's eradicated. Your debt is gone. Now, just as you're doing a little sort of you know, backflips in the lobby because you're so relieved by this, I mean, think about the relief that would come as a result of that. Just, wow, I mean, it's unbelievable. What's been weighing you down 24-7 has now been lifted. And just when you're finished with your back flipping, the president says, um, that's not it, dude. The same guy who paid off your $20 million debt also deposited $40 million into your account. And you go, what? Because if your debt has been paid and you walk out of the bank debt-free with a clean slate, it's only going to be a matter of minutes before you start going into debt again. The good news of the gospel is not only that your debt has been paid, the $20 million debt has been paid, but that $40 million has been deposited into your account so that you can never, never go into debt again, ever. So when Jesus says to the rich young ruler, there's no one good but God, that should bring you relief because now the, the performance treadmill you've been living on your entire life, you can now get off of 
Because this whole thing is riding on the strong shoulders of someone other than you. And God's love for you and his acceptance of you and his approval of you has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with what's been done for you. So as I said earlier, you live your life under a banner that reads, it is finished, full stop. Let's pray.